Uh, good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to uh, Voices in My Head, episode 42. This is uh, the show where Mr. Basil Sands talks about audiobooks and all kinds of stuff about the audiobook business and interviews really curious and interesting humans who are part of the audiobook business. Like today's guest for this here episode number 42 is Mr. Al Castle. He is a wonderful guy, and he and I, uh, unbeknownst to him, uh, competed in uh, some of the Scottish Highland games uh, long ago, uh, but I was disguised to look as a very, very large human uh, instead of a troll. So anyway, uh, off with the show, and I'm really curious to see what Mr. Castle has to say. Uh, enjoy. Howdy, folks, and welcome back to another episode of Voices in My Head, the podcast where we talk about audiobooks and all the stuff that the Leprechaun guys said that we'd talk about on the show. And as they mentioned, we have the lovely, the gorgeous Al Kessel here oh. on the show with us today. I am. Um, from Miss America competition, where yes. he, he stunned them in the bathing suit competition part. Um, not just stunned them, he actually knocked them out, as in they were unconscious. But that's that, what that's happened true. with Al in a bikini. So. <laughs> well thank you thank you for that wonderful introduction and uh, uh yeah just for you i put a shirt on so oh that's so <laughs> nice so um so how are things you're down in arizona i've been hearing some pretty amazingly hot deals going on down there in arizona or hot things going on what is the temperature down there uh, well, right now it's, I think, uh, it's, it's like, um, noon here. So it's about, um, 105 right now. And, uh, we're in the middle of monsoon. So the humidity is also bumping up there and the dew point. So we're, we're, we're pretty moist, a word that not very many people like. <laughs> it's an uncomfortable word for many. The, I'm, I'm, that's weird because I've never associate monsoon with Arizona. Oh yeah, yeah. We did not. Know we get that. it twice a year. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow! And a lot of rain comes with it. Well, um, the humidity. So sometimes, yeah. Um, over the last few years, you know, the rain has been kind of uh, a letdown. But this year, we've been we've been getting a lot of rain. We've had our backyard flooded a couple times so far. Wow! Wow! Now, does that? I'm assuming that drives like the uh, scorpions and the rattlesnakes and all that stuff into your houses. How yeah, does that affect generally. your narration? Well, it, I've 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 come to really accept it. Um, in fact, a lot of the scorpions now, I know on a first name basis. Oh, okay. And and they help me. You know, I, I've got a several that sit on the ledge over here, and uh, you know they'll direct me or they'll cheer me on when I'm really doing when it, it's hard and I'm really struggling. They'll cheer me on. Come on, Al, you can do it. You can do it. <laughs> and when you screw up, they'll walk out. Bang! Right there. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I, I, uh, the back of my neck is just yes. all welted up and everything. Well, you know, that's that's the price you pay for having other life forms in the booth with you. That's so when right. You up, when you get in the morning and you get up to go to the booth to start recording, do you have to, like, open the door, turn your booth upside down, and shake it a little bit before you go in? Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, and because it's a TARDIS, it makes it a little harder because, you know, a lot heavier than it looks. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And with all that extra room on the inside, you got to, like, jiggle right. around at different angles to get the stuff to fall out. Mm -hmm. So, that is very true. I had forgotten that your booth was a TARDIS. Yes. That yes. is extremely cool. It that's, is. That's. I wish I could do, well, I could do that on mine. I'm just, once I built it, I got too lazy to keep painting. <laughs> yeah, the fiberboard looks okay just the way it is. It's right. So, audiobooks. Mm -hmm. When, what did you, uh, describe for me the path that you took to get into where you're at today in audiobooks? Well, it, it's it's kind of a uh, fate um, path, if you want to if you want to look at it that way. Um, you know, years ago, my wife and I were heavily into podcasting. We we did all kinds of podcasts. Um, our first one was a was a Disney oriented podcast, Disneyland podcast, and um, we had interviewed a, a former cast member hmm. who wrote a book. He wrote a, you know, a tell all book about his time, uh, in the, I think it was late seventies, early eighties as, as a cast member there. Mm -hmm. And then after we, uh, after the show was over, you know, he sent me a, a, an email and he asked me if I had ever, uh, narrated audio books before. And I said, no, I've never done that before. And he goes, 
I love your voice and I think your voice is perfect. I want you to narrate my book. Hmm. So that was my very first, uh, my very first foray wow. into audiobooks. So you weren't even searching for it. It just came no, to you. It just came to me. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, he, and he gave me a lot of time, you know, to, cause I told him, you know, I'm working a full-time job and this is all new to me. So, uh, uh pause there for just a sure. second now. Got someone who just came up on my door here. Yes. Huh. Oh, hey. Mailman. Hold on. Oh. <laughs> Hi, huh, U.S. Postal Carrier. Hi. Nicest postman in the business. Uh, anyway, uh, he um, he gave me as much time as I needed because I was working a full-time job. So I was taking my time trying to learn, you know, a little bit of the, the audiobook industry while I was doing this. Um, and then in, uh, in uh, March of 2013, after 15 years on the job, uh, I was laid off. Uh, me, yeah, me and uh, 19 other people were, were laid off. Um, I used to work for a, uh, a for-profit university. I was the uh, Veterans uh, Education Benefits Administrator. Oh, okay. And, uh, you know, my wife and I work for the same company, and uh, she, uh, she didn't lose her job. But on the way home that day, uh, I'm freaking out, trying to figure out what the heck I'm going to do. I'm, you know, close to 50 years old. I've been working in one field for forever. Mm. And what am I qualified to do? And she grabbed my arm and she said, don't worry about getting another job right now. We can survive off of what I make. Concentrate on making your voice thing work. Mm. And she's been my biz biggest supporter and, you know, yeah, biggest uh, kick in the butt ever since. That is excellent. So, so you were with like a veteran services contractor? No, actually, I worked for the university. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, we had to... Curious, because my day job is with the Veterans Administration. Yeah. So it's always neat to see the different oh, interactions yeah. and different interagency stuff that goes on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I work I work closely with the with the state VA mm. uh, here in Arizona uh, to set up the education benefits. And uh, I love that job. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, that job defined me. Right. Is, uh, you know, I was in the Army... Um, and uh, I, I just I, I have a passion for for our veterans and for our service people. Right now in the army, if I remember correctly, were you artillery? Am I remembering? Right? Uh, no, I was combat engineer. Engineer. OK, same thing. Yeah. Blow stuff up. Except blow stuff up. Put it back together. That's right. We build them and then we blow them up. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> did you enjoy that kind of work? I okay. did. I really did. A little bit too much. Oh, yeah. I think. Yeah, I mean, to this day, and, and that was back in the 80s, uh, to this day, I remember how to <laughs> fashion anti-personnel uh, devices. Uh, I, I can make a homemade napalm in case anybody's interested. Forget it. I'm not going to do it. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Well, you know, that, that keeps the invaders at bay. Folks like it does. Yourself, out there in the desert, the red dawn types are like, well, no, because <laughs> Al is still out there. Wolverines! <laughs> So you got into the, the audiobook thing by chance there. You got that book. How did it continue after that first book? I mean, the first one just kind of fell in your lap. Boom. Right. You want this. Right. What did you do to, to continue on? Because I'm, I'm, I'm assuming the rest of the books didn't just fall into your lap after that. Well, actually, the first couple did uh, after oh, that. Um, you have a very you know, false susceptible lap. I do. It's big. It's, it, and it catches a lot of things. Were you wearing the kilt at the time? Right. I was. So in the sporin, it would fall. Yes, exactly. Just like a best. Um, yeah, the, I, I, I'd set up a profile in ACX and, you know, being a noob, I knew nothing. And um, so I, 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 accept, I, I accepted a couple of jobs, um, royalty share, uh, and they, were, they weren't bad books. They were actually pretty good books. These people were very trusting, <laughs> some you know trusting somebody who had little to no experience. But um, you know, I got through those, and then I started uh, doing a lot of research and a lot of training. Um, I trained with uh, Sean Pratt uh, and a few other people, and I started learning the business. And it it's taken me, you know, several years to learn the business to the point where. You know, I feel comfortable going out there and saying, okay, this is what I want. Right, right. Yeah, it does take that time to, to I mean, because you don't know what to search for. 
right. at the beginning, and you don't know what's going to what's going to be that thing that you want to do in the end. Genre wise, now that you've been out here and you've been feeling your way through the different stuff, and you've been with some major uh, publishers as well, mm -hmm. um, what genre do you feel most compelled to narrate, or is there a specific genre? I don't think there's really a specific genre. Um, I I get a lot of nonfiction books. Uh, apparently, I have that commanding type of voice that uh, <laughs> that that and actually, I've been told that, you know, that I have the kind of voice that that can make dull subjects a little more you know palatable. Um, but I truly like to narrate just about every genre there is. I've narrated everything from, you know, uh, Christian nonfiction to um, to science fiction, to Westerns, to classic Westerns, to classic sci fi, stuff like that. And kind of everything in between there. Pretty much, yeah. Everything but romance. I haven't done that yet. But then, you know, sometimes there's those good writers, and you're like, oh, does that work? I mean, anatomic. Does that work? Huh. <laughs> you're taking notes as you're, oh, hey, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you've, uh, so you've been doing audiobooks, what, now, eight years? You said you, you got some uh, 2013. 2013, so 2013. Oh, 2013. Um, okay. Yeah, so, five yeah, years. about five years. How, what, uh, how do you feel you have grown differently what, what how do you look at the business differently today than you did five years ago well first of all i look at it more like a business uh, like it is um when i first started i i just um uh, it, let me give you this analogy um the first time i went to disneyland was in 2007 never been there before in my life mm. um my wife and i go and the minute we walk through the gates i am all over the place i went here 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 no structure to what I was doing. That's kind of like it was for me when I started audiobooks. Mm. I was everywhere. I wanted to do this, 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 and this. And I, I couldn't focus on any one thing. So I learned a lot of different things, but a little bit of a lot of different things. Mm. So over the years, I've kind of been able to, you know, whittle that down to be able to learn this thing and then move on to this thing, and then move on to this thing. And in the beginning, I, I guess it could be described that I, I was treating it like a hobby instead of a business. Now I'm treating it more like a business, and I'm, I've got more confidence in myself than I did back then. Uh, I mean, I, I just finished my first book for Tantor. So, you know, I feel like I'm wearing my big boy pants now. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm treating it more professionally, I think. You know, I, I, I've, I've come to the decision, this is what I do. I'm an audiobook narrator. I'm an actor. So. Right. When, did, did, you, did you make a conscious switch in your mind saying, at one point saying, you know, I'm a, a veteran's voc rehab advocate to I'm an actor? Mm -hmm. I did, you, actually. It's like a, two totally different career streams there. Right. Yeah, and it was it was difficult. I mean, it was honestly probably one of the most difficult things I've ever done in my life, um, emotionally and you know, uh, uh, intelligence-wise. I because for so long I identified as a certain thing. I identified as the VA administrator. I was identified as an employee of somebody else, and it took me a long time to make that switch. And then just all of a sudden, one day I, I woke up and I wasn't making any progress in this business at all. Um, my wife never complained, but I could, you know, she was doing without, I mean, she was making a lot of sacrifices for me. So one day I woke up and I, 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 I had a long, long talk with myself and I decided at that moment, I'm no longer the VA guy. I'm no longer an employee. I am an actor and I'm working for myself. Mm. And then from that moment forward, I began to structure things differently. I began to see things differently. And I think it was at that point when things started making this, the, the, the switch. I think that's, that's a really good picture, mental picture that you put there, because we do have to make that switch in our mind. I mean, if we're really going to pursue this as, as a career, mm -hmm. you have to identify as this is what I am. This is... Uh, this is the direction that I want to take and right. acknowledge that you have the ability to do this. Could you have pictured yourself doing this, say, 25 years ago? 
absolutely not. And all my life, though, I, all my life, I've I always knew that I wanted to be in the entertainment world somehow. And um, it used to be when I was younger, I wanted to be a stuntman. Mm. Um, but you know, <laughs> aches and pains over the years of playing football and competing in the Scottish Highland Games. It's like, yeah, forget that. That would have never worked. <laughs> Yeah. And then I, you know, I put that away for most of my adult uh, working life. And uh, I think, you know, I think that's probably part of it. Y you've got to, you've got to wake that kid up inside of you again. Mm. That's, that's pretty good. Man, you're all full of good analogies here. Have you ever, <laughs> have you ever thought about uh, becoming a psychiatrist? Or psychologist? Actually, uh, funny that you say that. I have a, I have a, a bachelor's degree in behavioral science, so. Oh, well, there you, go. There you go. So you, Al, had some uh, interesting experiences in your younger life, being not too long ago younger, as I understand. <laughs> you were one of those guys who dresses up in, in skirts and shirts and throws logs and rocks at That's other right. things. Dis explain this, this <laughs> anomaly to us. Well, um, from my mother's side uh, of the uh, family tree, I'm Scottish. Um, so <laughs> I, uh, several years ago, I got heavily into the Scottish Highland Games. Um, for anybody who doesn't, isn't familiar with that, it's basically what, uh, what Basil said. It is a bunch of guys in, in skirts throwing heavy things. Um, we're like the strong men competitions, only instead of just lifting them, we throw them. Yeah. Um, the caber, the big telephone thing, the phone thing, the caber. Um, my wife and I went to a, a Highland Games here in uh, in Arizona. Uh, I was in, I think, 2000, mm. and uh, I, we, you know, we stopped over by the uh, the the athletic field and we were watching the competitions. I was like, "Holy cow, that is so cool!" Mm. And I started talking to one of the athletes, and uh, you know, he said, "Why don't you come out?" and, uh, you know, practice with us uh, next weekend. And I did, and I got hooked. Mm -hmm. So I started competing in the Scottish Highland Games. And, um, in fact, uh, over the next five years or so, six years, I think, um, I got to be one of the top competitors in the state of Arizona. Mm -hmm. uh, I competed here in Arizona. I competed in California, uh, Nevada, um, and Colorado. And did all the competitions through there, and uh, it was actually quite fun. And uh, believe it or not, there are professional Scottish Highland athletes oh, yeah. who make fairly decent money. And uh, I was this close to to making the decision with a friend of mine. We were both going to turn pro. He turned pro. I didn't because uh, I blew out my shoulder and had to have it replaced. Ouch. But yeah, and yeah. That calls an end to that career. I it mean, does. Having a metal shoulder isn't conducive, and and. You know, to to put a number on this, how much do those tabers weigh? Uh, anywhere from uh, well, they, they, they it depends. They have a bike class. Um, I was a class A competitor, so our tabers went anywhere from about 110 to 120 pounds, and about 12 to 15 feet tall. Mm. So, if any of you guys out there that are listening to this understand geometry and <laughs> physics, that's 12 feet tall being thrown out at an angle. Mm. So your body is really torquing to get that right. 120 pounds up into the air and going any kind of distance. Right. Yeah. What you have to do with the caber is it has to be like a, it has to be flipped. Um, the end down on the bottom is narrower than the top. So and that's that's the mm -hmm. side you hold. So you have to flip it and it has to flip like that so that the small end is pointing away from you when it when it lands. So it has to do a full rotation. Right. So it's like a, it's scored on a, on a clock face, a 12 o'clock throw, which is where the small end is directly, you know, at 12 o'clock your position. That's the perfect throw. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Who knew that there was so much science to guys in skirts throwing sticks? That's right. So, or trees. Science. Trees, <laughs> and that was the motto at the Highland Games, scotch and science. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's pretty, I guess that's why the Romans never did take them. That's right. <laughs> so, how does this correlate to audiobooks? There's the um, we're going to ask. Yeah, actually, it doesn't. <laughs> Not at all. Um, except maybe it gives me a little bit of uh, life experience, uh, you know, in case there's ever a Scottish Highland game character in a book. Right? Yeah, a guy who, I mean, you'd know the motivation behind why he likes to throw. That's right. Holes. 
That's right. So, and and if anyone ever invaded your studio, you know, you'd be one punch man. Right? That's you'd right. Boom, and he's out. Plus, I have William Wallace to help me. William Wallace. William Wallace. Freedom. Freedom. <laughs> That's pretty cool. You have a whole bunch of those things on your desk. I saw a picture of, I your, do. of your studio. My studio is just kind of a mess of, <laughs> well, mine looks like my day job. I'm an IT guy by day and a narrator by every other hour of the clock. And yeah, yeah. mine looks like a messy IT shop. <laughs> so, yeah, I got to have my posse around me. So. That's it. All your little characters. That's right. So all my characters are all in my head. So there. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So you do that. Uh, I, I remember on Facebook, you were showing that you did this train ride thing. You were the engineer mm -hmm. of a choo-choo train at a, at a park there. Uh, tell, tell us about that. That just looks like <laughs> a fun job. Tell me about that. Yeah, it was. Uh, I'm no longer doing it. They, oh, okay. they were bought out by another company, and they brought their own people in. But uh, in our community park here, uh, in the, I don't, we don't actually live in Phoenix. We live about 20 miles north of Phoenix. And um, we have a nice-sized community park, and there's a couple – small lakes and then there's a, a small scale uh train mm -hmm. that uh you can ride and it takes you on a loop through the park and uh, uh as a as a part-time gig when i was struggling to get this uh thing going here um i went to work for them um uh, i i did it on the weekends i got to drive this train and it was it was a blast i i absolutely enjoyed it i got to you know i got to bring out a lot, a lot of my characters out and you know, treat the kids, you know, so fun. And, yeah. and, and I tried to turn it into like a Disneyland attraction. Nice. Um, I had a great time, except for the summer, because the summer's in a metal train, oh, 110 no. degrees. Yeah. I imagine so. Ladies and gentlemen, if you look to the right, <laughs> there's a bunch of dead brown stuff. Yeah, that's right. To the left. Yeah, that's a body. Let's go that's on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the desert. <laughs> That, did you live somewhere other than the desert when you were younger? Uh-huh. I lived in uh, – I actually was born and uh, spent a lot of years in, in Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Hey, definitely not desert there. No. Can't be too more extreme. <laughs> no. Yeah. no, no. How about uh, – let me bring the boys out because I know that they All were right. to ask some questions here. So we're going to bring them out and see what they have to say. Hey, guys, you ready to come out? Oh, yes, Mr. Bassett, we've just been waiting in the wings here. Oh, hello, Mr. Kessel. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? We are excellent. Well, I am excellent. I can speak for my brothers because I'm the eldest and I'm allowed to, but I might be lying on their behalf. So anyway, I am excellent, and my name is Feely. Not Feely. excellent. It's not excellent. My name is Feely, and Feely, being me, is excellent. Are you, like, hey. touchy-feely? Are you just Feely? Not typically. You're not um. my type. I'm sorry. <laughs> Although the Love, beard yeah. is kind of sexy. I would say <laughs> that. So I like my women with nice beards and good smooth back hair. Oh, there you go. But I think that's where the resemblance goes away from you. So sorry <laughs> to say that. Uh, anyway, I'm heartbroken. This is my brother, Neely. Hi, Neely. Say hi, <laughs> Neely. Hi, how are you doing, Mr. Castle? It's nice to meet you in person. We've seen you before, but only illegally when we were actually on the run and you were just happened to be walking by in that mall in Phoenix that one day. Mm. And uh, Anyway, I should pass this on to my brother before I get myself into legal trouble. Okay, this is my brother Boffin. Oh, hello. Hey, Boffin, how are you? I'm fine. And uh, I don't talk as much as them, so I'm going to pass this on to Berthold, our other brother. Mm. Berthold, say hello. Oh, hello. I'll say hello for me and my brother Buffin. Buffin says hello to a lot of things, but he doesn't always reply even to himself, and he talks to himself. Anyway, we've talked too much, and we're just kind of rambling on, and you have some scenarios and some questions that need to be answered by yourself oh, no. toward us. I hope you're ready for this. Ah, uh, I'm scared. Okay, we have a series of questions that may be related or not related at all to each other. And then a scenario that will be made up somewhere toward the end of all this. <laughs> okay, the first question comes from Neely. Neely, go for your question. Okay, here's my question. Your last name is Castle, but you said that your mom was Scottish. Mm -hmm. So, is your father German, or, or how did you get the Castle name? Or is, Very... that, or is that just a mispronunciation of some, like, Scottish word? Yeah, it's actually it it it's 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 spelled Kessel, but it's pronounced Mackay. No, I'm kidding. Um, 
Yeah. No, actually, very good. Yeah. My uh, my father was a bohemian, uh, which doesn't exist anymore. So it's kind of oh, you know I'm that sorry, whole Bavarian. Inside. Yes. Yeah. The whole the whole country was just uh, you know, one day this big purplish guy did that, and the half the country was gone. And boom! Half the bohemians were gone. That's right. No, so no. they just said, boom, let's not do it anymore. But yeah, yeah. So uh, it's actually, you know, uh, technically Bohemian German on my father's side. Yeah. Oh, okay. Do you speak any German? Uh, nein. Oh, that was a tricky word to play there. You got us on that one. Nine, he says. We know that it's actually seven and a half. So, <laughs> that's right. Anyway. Okay, so that's that question. So now we know that he's half German, half Scottish. Do you ever paint yourself blue? I I, I have once. Was that because you had imbibed too much or you mm. just uh, got confused and painted yourself blue? Yeah, I got confused. We were painting the we were painting the studio blue and I was standing too close to the wall, so I painted myself and it was yeah. So they should make that part of the Highland Games, you know, since the Scots are known for painting themselves blue to scare the <laughs> Romans. They should uh, make all the people paint like blue stripes to indicate your tribe or whatever. Your, That's your a good clan. idea. Your clan. Okay, I'm going to pass on to the next question to my brother Boffin. Boffin, you got enough words for this one? I think so. Okay, here comes the next question for you. So, since you're German and you're Scottish, do you prefer... A kilt or lederhosen? Uh, a kilt all the way. And why would that be? Uh, it's more freeing. That's a good point, because having leather underpants on is kind of, well, yeah. Chafing. Chafing <laughs> is a good word for that, yeah. Not that that's a good word in any no. context, actually. Okay, that's a very good point. So a kilt-wearing, not blue-painted Scottish German guy. Okay, uh, Feely, you got the next question. Okay, I'm the eldest brother, but I get the third in line. I see how this goes. Okay, here we go. The third question for this young man here is, have you ever been in a place where you actually were in the company of fairy folk before? As in um, that are, well, like fairy creatures. Like I think I have, actually, yes. Oh, really? Yeah. And what was it you can hear the, You can hear the fairy out there right now barking away. Ah, <laughs> I see the dogwood fairies. The dogwood fairies, yes. Uh, yeah, actually, I, uh, of course, this was after a bottle of single malt, uh, but I don't think that has anything to do with it. Oh. Um, yeah, you know, my wife and I were, <laughs> my wife and I were uh, on the beach in Southern California, and uh, yeah, little little fairy uh, flying all around me. It was kind of weird, actually. That yeah. is interesting. Well, if they were the flying kind, uh, did you get bit by any chance? I did. I did. Oh. And it was the weirdest thing. But before that, jet black hair. After that, this. That's what I was going to say. They sucked the life force right out of you. Which mm. tells me that you had a whole ton of life force in you. I did. Yeah, because those ones that do the, the blood sucking, uh, they're, they look, well, they seem like mosquitoes, but they're actually vicious little fairies, and they take your stuff and they give it to this guy named Reginald. And oh. they're trying to make a superhuman, except that he's only fairy size. So, you know, <laughs> he's like two inches tall. And, yeah, you know, like Ant-Man, but not. Ant so, so okay, so that's that. So, I see. We have evidence now. So, whoa, like I was saying, though, you must have a lot of life force in you. Because if they suck that and you still got your life and your hair, it's just mm -hmm. turned white. That is actually a very interesting thing. You must have been super powerful. Your wife must have been exhausted for most of your life. Yes, she, yeah, she was. Um, yeah, I was, I was a beast. I, what can I say? Wow. Well, with that, we're going to turn it over to Berthold for the scenario. Okay, here we go. Berthold, you got that scenario ready? Well, uh, kind of. I'm making it up as we go. Here we go. Okay, the scenario that we have for this kilt-wearing, not-blue-painted guy who got bit by a fairy. Okay, here we go. You're at the Highland Games in the actual Highlands. Mm. In a place that 
is kind of like that one town that shows up every thousand years or so and then vanishes and whoever happens to be there happens to get stuck inside of it for a thousand years or whatever that story was. I personally think that they all just got drunk and lost on the way home. <laughs> that's what I'm thinking, the whole village. But anyway, that's just me. So anyway, you're in this village for the Highland Games and you go up to throw the, the is it a caber or a tabor? Caber with a C. It's a caber, like a K-bar. Basil has a K-bar. It's a big mm. knife. Yeah, so K-bar, K-bur. Okay, so you chop down the caber with the K-bar, and then you throw the caber. Okay, you so go. you're picking up this caber to throw it across the green here and to flip it over and get your 12 o'clock mark and all that stuff and, and bring home the bacon. And do they actually pay you guys in bacon? Sometimes. Sometimes it's in haggis. That could be nice. Is there bacon in haggis? Uh, there could be. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> that could be interesting. I wonder if they make kosher haggis. Uh, I think they do. It has to be blessed by little tiny rabbi. That's right. That's right. Rabbi Shlochem. Mm -hmm. And Shlochem too. He was the smaller one. Part two. Right. Anyway, so you're about to throw this caber. And you lift it up and then all of a sudden a voice above you says, Al, Al, why are you going to throw me? What would you say? Because you're there. I must throw you. Oh, that's deep. That must be part of that psychological <laughs> degree that you had. They teach stuff like that. Whoa, it's there. Okay, but what if the voice comes back and says, But Al, haven't you ever watched Harry Potter? This is your magic wand, son. Stop throwing it. Use the magic. But I'm using my magic to throw it into a perfect 12 o'clock and win the, win the prize. Okay, that's pretty deep. This guy has all the answers to the questions that we got. <laughs> well, shoot. Okay, bring in the aliens. We always bring in the aliens at the end. Oh, okay. Here's one for you. So while you're doing this, suddenly a spaceship opens up and there's aliens standing there. Except you're not sure if they're total aliens because they're actually Simon Vance and Hilary Huber and Scott Brick and a couple of other people. And Johnny Heller sticks his head out from between them all and says, Hey, Al, want to come join the party? What would you do? Of course, they're on a spaceship and you just were talking to them all on Facebook like two minutes ago and they hmm. weren't on a spaceship. So, Well... I've met Simon uh, Vance, uh, Johnny Heller, and Scott Brick, and, and Hillary, by the way. Uh, and I do know for a fact that they are aliens. Um, so even though I was just talking to them on Facebook and, you know, they're here, I know that they're also there because they're metaphysical. Oh. So, of course, these big giant powerhouses in the narrating world, I'm going to join them because – they will impart their wisdom to me psychically. Whoa, that's pretty interesting. So, so the metaphysical part, isn't that the stuff that they use on those nonstick frying pans? Yeah, it is. that's what he's talking about. Oh, okay, it is. So, wow, that's pretty cool. So it's like the nonstick frying pan, they like throw it against it, it slides off and it hits you instead and then you mm -hmm. absorb all their stuff. That's interesting. An interesting thing about it, too, or interesting plus thing about it, is that, you know, Johnny Heller's actually one of us. He got rid of the accent a long time ago, but... I knew it. But he is. Simon is not one of us, but he's of a different type. You know, oh. he's from England across the water, so it's a little bit different over there, but it's very similar. Just don't ask him where that pot of gold is on his side, because, <laughs> you know, you ever seen the big teeth? Oh, yeah. That's scary. So anyway, it was great talking to you and pulling out of you the deep mysteries of the universe. And, well, you're just a smarter guy than we are, I guess, because we couldn't <laughs> stomp you. But that's okay, because it's, you know, we're leprechauns anyway. So That's right. So it's great talking to you, and we're going to get back to what we were doing before we were talking to you. It was great to talk to you guys. Have fun. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, guys. Thank you very much. Go in and make lunch. Thank you. And that was the Leprechauns for this episode of Voices in My Head. So, lots of fun those guys are. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Matter of fact, they got their own book out there. They do, and I listened to it. Ah, ah, and what did you think of it? I loved it. Excellent, because I loved making it. Yeah. <laughs>
it was. I'd a like lot. to. I'd like to hear more stories from them. I just got to get that time thing out there. <laughs> got to get. You need a TARDIS. That's it. That's it. So I can just keep going back and back and back mm-hmm. and redo it. That would make pickups so much easier. I could get the pickup <laughs> list before I actually make the mistake, and then come back and then and not make the right mistake the first time. That's right. Yeah. But then you create a paradox, a paradoxical loop where. If you correct the mistakes before you make the mistakes, then you don't make the mistakes, so you can't correct them. That's true. And if you do that twice in a row, you got a quadradox, which you know does that in a cube shape, I think. Yeah. And you cannot domesticate quadradoxes. I've tried. No. They are not easily housebroken. They're not. And the messes are very. They leave stains. They do. Bad stains. Bad. So, that 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 that's a that's an image. That's an image. <laughs> well, I tell you what, it's been terrific talking to you. Mm-hmm. And the uh, um, one of these days, we got to get together personally. I mean, we, Absolutely. We've chatted online for years now. And uh, matter of fact, I think you interviewed me on your podcast. I did. Wait, ago, like yeah. Five, six years ago. Yeah, uh, probably about five, five years, years ago, ago now. Yeah. And, uh, and that was a lot of fun. And, uh, but yeah. So it's it, one of these days, you know, that's that's the nice thing about the social media is that we can meet each other across the, the interwebs and folks get to know each other. And with the video part, it's almost like we've actually physically met each other. That's right. So. Just without the body owner. That's it. Well, then that was the show. Now, I know you may be wondering uh, because... You know, usually Mr. Basil's leprechauns do the intro part and I do the extra or outro part. Uh, But they were unavailable at the time of this final production uh, because they are all on leave. Uh, That is to say they are on holiday uh, in the south of Spain at the moment, uh, frolicking most likely nude on the beaches. Which, if you've ever been to a nude leprechaun beach, well, you probably don't want to ever go there unless you're a leprechaun. Is, is not a very lovely place to be, for most beings. Not that I have any stigmas about being naked in public. I am a troll after all. Anyway, <clears throat> time to uh, get on with things. This show is copyright 2020 by Sandman Production Studios of Alaska. Oh, and by the way, I really like that Al Kessel rode the choo-choo train. I love choo-choo trains. They're so tiny. Comfortable. I wish I had my own choo-choo. Make me all tear up for for the nostalgia of it. Hmm? <gasps> Goodbye. Choo-choo. Chugga-chugga-chugga-choo-choo.